So I was drinking beers with this guy named Matthew Cummings. He owns a handmade glass company in downtown Knoxville, Tennessee, and he uses his handmade glassware next door at the brewery that he also owns. And Matthew told me, whatever you do, don't drink out of a pint glass, which is of course like the classic beer glass. And he called it by its original name, which is a shaker pint. The worst glass for beer or any kind of beverage ever. It's not designed to drink out of. It's designed to be the other half of a mixer. It, it stacks well, that's it. They're garbage for beer, garbage for anything. I mean, they probably even make Coke and ice taste worse. I don't know, I can't prove that, but. So what should we all be drinking out of instead? Well, Matthew is gonna show us some design features to look for, and we're gonna talk about beer because beer is what Matthew makes, but this is applicable to anything you could drink. The first thing that a shaker pint lacks is any kind of taper toward the top. In fact, it does the opposite. It opens up as it rises, and that makes these really good for stacking, but that's about all they're good for. But if you've got a little extra space in which to store your glassware, Matthew says look for a glass that tapers back in as it rises up. That taper that you see in a classic red wine glass, for example, the most obvious thing that this taper does is it concentrates, it funnels the drink down to a more narrow point so that you can get it into your mouth without dribbling all over yourself. You know, people make fun of hipsters for drinking out of mason jars, but the shoulder on the mason jar performs the same function as the taper on the wine glass. I mean, it's there for pickling. It's there to keep the stuff submerged and keep it from floating up out of the pickling liquid when you're pickling. But when you drink out of it, it concentrates the liquid down to a small stream and keeps you from dribbling all over yourself. Nice. And a narrowing top does have other functions. One thing it does for beer is it supports the head, that blanket of bubbles that rises up from the surface of the beer, especially when you do a fast pour like this. If the glass is too wide at the top, more bubbles will be exposed to air and they will pop too soon. Though honestly, Matthew wishes some of these would pop a little quicker. So we're just letting this, what we're doing right now is we're doing what's called a stacked pour. So we pour it about half foam and let it, let it condense down. And what that's gonna do is the larger bubbles are gonna escape and then we're gonna be left with a really tight, dense network of small bubbles of really strong head. He waits patiently for about five minutes and then tops off the head. This is the stacking of the stacked pour. And because he waited for the larger bubbles to pop, this massive head has a finer bubble structure that's more stable and it has the texture of like a marshmallow. So that's just like, I mean, look at that. Hold on, I'm gonna get a real tight shot. All right, make it, make it clap. Look there at that. Go. There you go. <sighs> Yeah, that's about as pretty as the delicious pasta that we had the other night, courtesy of HelloFresh, sponsor of this video. Go to HelloFresh.com and use my code AdamRagusia50 for 50% off, plus your first box ships free. They offer all kinds of meal kits, but we usually opt for vegetarian. Lauren orders this green vernal pasta recipe every spring. It's one of their Hall of Famers. April is Earth Month, and on average, HelloFresh meals have a 31% lower carbon footprint print than the same meals made from supermarket ingredients. Chiefly, this is because the ingredients come pre-portioned, which reduces food waste by about a quarter. Plus, you don't have to go to the grocery store or figure out what you're gonna use the rest of whatever ingredient you just bought. And this meal costs only about three quarters of what a comparable takeout meal would run you. Nearly all HelloFresh packaging materials are curbside recyclable in most areas of the US. Both of us know how to cook, but we love having HelloFresh handle dinner for us a few nights a week just to relieve some pressure. You can pause deliveries or change your plan anytime. Go to HelloFresh.com and use code AdamRagusia50 for 50% 50 off, plus your first box ships free. Thank you, HelloFresh. Anyway, we were talking about why really good beer glasses tend to be shaped, well, kind of like a lady. And here's the Willendorf Venus of glasses. This one does a lot more than just support a big foamy head. I'm going to only fill this up to about yay so we can really see what this aggressive tulip with this really bulbous bottom can do to the aroma. Matthew is pouring a beer he brews called Castronaut. It's a double IPA made to be very high in these fruity aromatic compounds called thiols. Basically like pure thiol precursors. In case anyone thinks Matthew is not self-aware about it, his bar is called the Pretentious Beer Company. He knows what's up. Anyway, the glass. 
I'm going to only fill this up to about yay. He's leaving lots of room in the glass to collect aroma. The big bulb at the bottom creates a wide beer-to-air interface through which gases escape the liquid. That dramatic taper of the neck traps the gases, it concentrates them, and then the slight widening at the lip allows those smells to push out and bloom around you as you drink. A perfect glass to highlight aromatic qualities. Compared to this smaller glass where the bulb is at the very top, this is a much simpler machine. It's their tasting glass. Customers can try a little bit of a beer before they commit, and the reason the bulb is at the top is simply so your nose can fit inside such a small glass and you'll get a big hit of the aroma. Here's a glass that's only the bulb. It's like a stemless wine glass, and it's for this very dark, very high alcohol beer that Matthew makes. He thinks it tastes better when it's a little warmer, so the glass is fat and stout to increase contact with your hot little hand. So like a tall skinny glass, you're going to be just touching it with your fingertips, right? And then the more snifter style, you're really going to be grabbing a hold of it, letting your body temperature affect the temperature of the liquid. But of course, other drinks taste good when they're as cold as possible, and one way to minimize the transfer of your body heat is to use a glass with a handle, which is what they're making next door at the Pretentious Glass Company. You can actually bring your beer, sit at this bar, and watch them hand blow glass. First, they draw some melted glass out of their main furnace, which has a name, Gladys. Big, beautiful, powerful, sexy machine named after Gladys Knight. I'll tell you, nothing prepares you for the blast of heat that you get standing in front of these things. It's like standing at the gates of hell. First thing they'll do is roll that blob of glass inside a wooden block. It's wet so it doesn't catch fire. Now we've got that core heat is different than the outside heat because we let it cool down. So Greenwood is going to put it into our reheating chamber, which is also about 2300 degrees. Not surprisingly, these dudes all have lots of war wounds. Once the temperature of the glass is homogenized, Matthew can blow into the end of this pipe and inflate a little bubble. Heat it back up again and repeat the process until the bubble is big enough to fill up the mold, which will put a decorative diamond pattern around the glass. Nice old school touch. And these are the same tools and techniques that you would use a thousand years ago to make glass. The outer bulb of the glass is going to be the bottom of the glass, and it's about done. So you get another guy to prepare a second rod called a punty with another little glob of glass on it. They merge the two together. And then we need this to break off without this guy breaking off. And crack! There's the mouth of the glass. Now they can start widening the mouth and smoothing out the lip. Last thing they'll do is put on the handle. Virtually impossible for one person to do working alone. You can see why a glass as complicated as this would have been really expensive back in the day. Now, this is not part of the process, but they have this wax that they keep around for lubing their tools and such, and the wax is highly flammable. So they're gonna throw a little wad of that wax right into the hot glass, just for giggles. <laughs> Oh, and it cracked a piece. Oh, it cracked a piece! <laughs> yeah, most of the cracks melted out in the furnace. Now they tap that punty to break it off, smooth out the bottom, and after it cools down slowly in an oven, you'll have a glass for a beer that's best enjoyed cold because the handle keeps your body heat away. But if you don't have a handle, look for a tall, skinny glass to keep the drink cold. Hardly any of that beer is coming into contact with the heat of my hands. And of course, lots of the design of glassware is purely aesthetic, just for pretty. So, like this is, I was thinking like a Rothko painting. I wanted to do something that sculpt the liquid in a way that lets you see different thicknesses of that beer and get these beautiful color variations. Well, I like how all the subtle tapering creates pinch points that are easy to grip, which is important as your motor skills deteriorate through the night. You can order stuff from Pretentious Glass Company online, hashtag not an ad. We'll finish by looking at one of their more novel designs, just for fun. This glass has a little mountain peak inside of it, and it's there to look pretty, of course, but also the little rough spots in it create bubble nucleation sites. A bubble needs some kind of imperfection on which to form, and indeed, if you see bubbles gathering along the side of your glass, that's an indication that it might actually be dirty. 
any halfway decent beer bar these days will have these uh, water spritzers. Um, what's the technical term for a water spritzer? Oh. Nice one, dude off camera. But it's just called a rinser, and it's there to knock off any specks of dust or grime that would serve as a bubble nucleation site on the side of the glass. When lots of bubbles form on the side of the glass, that's an indication that the inside was either all scratched up or it was dirty. And it keeps the beer from clinging to the side of the glass in these nice, clean, smooth sheets called lacing. You see how it has this pattern? It's clinging to the vessel. And as you drink it, you'll get these different layers and it looks like lace. And so that means that it's a high quality beer with good protein structure and it's a beer clean glass. It's clean to that side. So if you walk in and you see, just glance around the room, if you see a bunch of glasses with lacing on them, it's a good spot. Nice tip, but anyway, the glass with the mountain in it. The mountain creates a bubble nucleation site safely away from the sides of the glass, and as a result, the head of the beer, or in this case cider, it replenishes itself as you drink. You swirl the drink around in your hand, bubbles form on the mountain, they rise up and create a more frothy head. Nice. Now let's be very clear about what this video you just watched was not. This video is not an excuse for you to go out there and get all snobby when somebody orders a beer in the wrong glass. There is no wrong glass. Drink your beer out of lots of different glasses. You'll get different things out of them. You can learn about them in different contexts. It's just like a friend. Friends are cool to talk to online and stuff, but try them in another context, like a bar sometime, and you might see a whole other side of them.